Hello again, Psych 370 students, and welcome to another video lecture for week 16. The last two video lectures have been parts of a Zoom class where I talked about the operant learning model and the social cognitive theory of observational learning. So this video lecture is another part of that Zoom class where I'll be comparing and contrasting those theories a little bit. So again, Bandura explained observational learning by invoking these cognitive processes, these mental processes that he thought took place in the mind of the observer. Yeah. And he felt like his theory was the superior one because he didn't think the operant learning model could explain A, why the consequences of the model's behavior should affect what, whether the observers will imitate that behavior, and B, why observers would learn behaviors but not perform them until they were motivated to do so. Those are the two problems that Bandura pointed out with the operant learning model. Now, Bandura's theory is still a popular theory of observational learning, but like I said before, so is the operant learning model. So guys, the reason that social cognitive theory hasn't supplanted the operant learning model is because the operant learning model can actually account for those two problems that Bandura identified. So for example, Bandura said, that generalized imitation could not explain why people would be more likely to imitate a reinforced model than they would a punished model, right? He didn't think that the theory could explain why a model's consequences should make a difference. But actually, it can explain that, okay? All you gotta do is just revise what you mean by generalized imitation. So maybe we don't just learn that imitation itself is likely to get reinforced. Maybe it's more complicated than that. Maybe we learn that it's a good idea to imitate those we see getting reinforced, and it's not a good idea to imitate those we see getting punished, right? It's not a leap to say that that's what we learn. So in other words, the operant learning viewpoint can explain the concepts of vicarious reinforcement and vicarious punishment by just incorporating the consequences of the model's behavior as part of the discriminative stimulus. So if you see a model getting reinforced, then that's a cue that doing the same thing yourself will probably get reinforced too, right? And if you see a model getting punished, look, that's a discriminative stimulus too. That si just signals something else to you. It signals to you that doing the same thing yourself will probably also get punished. Yeah. So guys, with generalized imitation, it's not just that we learn to imitate no matter what, full stop, right? Rather, we learn to imitate reinforced actions. We learn not to imitate punished actions. So the theory can actually account for those vicarious reinforcement and vicarious punishment phenomena that Bandura thought it could. The concept of generalized imitation isn't actually incompatible with those findings about vicarious reinforcement and vicarious punishment that Bandura reported. Okay. So that's not as big a problem for the operant learning model as Bandura thought it was. And as for the other problem with the operant conditioning viewpoint that Bandura identified, he didn't think it made any provisions for an observed behavior being learned, but not performed, right? So he found that the kids who saw the punished model still learned from those observations, right? They still noticed, remembered, and acquired the capacity to perform the model's behaviors, but they didn't actually imitate those behaviors until they were offered an incentive for doing so. And Bandura thought that that finding was very problematic for those who want to view observational learning as just a form of operant conditioning. But guys, the thing is, researchers in operant conditioning actually have a very long history of recognizing the distinction between learning something and performing it. So there's this distinction that we make between learning and performance, okay? So that's why we defined learning in this course as a change in behavioral potential, right? And not just as a change in behavior because there can be, and there often is a difference between what you know, what you've learned, right? And what you do, <laughs> what you perform. So for example, this was most famously demonstrated in a classic experiment by Edward Tolman, and Charles Hanzik, the results of which were reported back in 1930. So I'm going to tell you about that research. This is, a, this is a classic study. Now, the experiment involved a fairly complex maze, like this one, and three groups of rats, okay? 
Now the rats in each group were exposed to the same maze, the same number of times, but those groups differed in one key variable, which was whether or not food was available at the end of the maze, okay? Now for the rats in this first group, it always was. Those rats always got reinforced with food whenever they made it to the end of the maze. For the rats in this third group, it never was. They never got reinforced with food when they made it to the end of the maze. But the interesting group is this middle group, group two. So for them, food was absent from the maze for the first 10 days of the experiment. Right? And then starting on the 11th day, it was added to the maze. Okay. So that was the independent variable in this experiment, right? They manipulated the availability of food in the maze across these three groups. And the dependent variable was errors. So what they measured was the number of wrong turns that the rats made as they navigated the maze. So that's how the study was set up. Now let's look at the results. As you can see in this graph, for the first 10 days of the experiment, it was the rats in that first group. It was the always rewarded rats who showed the biggest improvement in their performance. Okay, So they went from an average of nine or 10 errors on day one, down to about four on day 10. Yeah. Rats in the other two groups, they showed some improvement, some reduction in errors, but not as much. However, look at what happened after day 11. Look at what happened after food was added to the maze for the rats in that second group. In particular, look at this huge drop in errors for that group from day 11 to day 12. So it was like, as soon as they thought there might be some food waiting for them, at the end of that maze, those rats started getting through the maze just as well, just as accurately as the rats that had been getting rewarded the whole time. So guys, what that seems to indicate is that even though they weren't demonstrating it yet in their outward behavior, the rats in that group were learning about the layout of the maze, right? They were learning how to get from the beginning of it to the end of it in the most efficient way they could, okay? So the behavioral potential was changing, in other words, right? They were learning. They just didn't have any reason to translate that learning into their actual performance until the prospect of food gave them an incentive to do that. So guys, we have a name for this phenomenon that Tolman and Hanzik identified. We call it latent learning, okay? This is known as latent learning. So guys, the word latent basically means hidden, okay? Here's a few definitions of it. Uh, present but not visible, right? Remaining in an inactive or hidden phase, existing in dormant form, right? So latent basically means hidden. And so guys, those rats, in the Tolman and Hansik study, these, these rats in the second group here, um, again, they were learning about the maze, right? Their behavioral potential was changing, right? But for the first 10 days of that experiment, that learning was hidden, right? It was latent. It wasn't actually apparent in their performance. They had to be motivated with food to demonstrate that learning. And of course, we could say the same thing about the kids in Bandura's Bobo doll research who saw the model being punished for beating up Bobo. So those kids were learning those aggressive behaviors, right? They were acquiring them. They were adding those behaviors to their own behavioral potential, but that learning remained hidden. It remained latent until Bandura gave the kids a reason to show him what they had learned by offering an incentive like the stickers and the juice. So guys, latent learning, it's an accepted phenomenon in operant conditioning, okay? And so proponents of the operant learning model of observational learning, they would just say that Bandura's results are just another example of it. These results are just another example of latent learning, okay? So those kids, the kids who saw the model being punished, they didn't need to get reinforced in order to learn from what they saw, right? but they did need the prospect of reinforcers. They did need that incentive for them to actually perform what they had learned. 
And again, operant conditioning theorists have long recognized this distinction between learning and performance. So the fact that Bandura's kids demonstrated latent learning, the fact that they showed a difference between what they had learned and what they actually did, again, it's not really as big a problem for the operant learning model as Bandura wanted to claim it was. So guys, the point is both social cognitive theory and the operant learning model, they can account for the results that Bandura observed in his Bobodal research. They just do it in different ways, okay? So whereas Bandura's own social cognitive theory relies on cognitive processes like attention and memory and expectation, uh, the operant learning model relies more on conditioning principles like discriminative stimuli, generalized imitation, and reinforcement. But like I said, they're both still very popular theories of observational learning. And you know, which one you're probably gonna prefer probably just depends on whether you consider yourself more of a behaviorist or more of a cognitivist, right? So behaviorists tend to prefer the operant learning model, right? Because it emphasizes these ob observable external events that occur in the environment, right? Whereas cognitive psychologists are more comfortable attributing overt behaviors to the underlying covert mental processes. So they're probably gonna to tend to prefer Bandura's social cognitive theory. Okay, well, I hope all that makes sense. But if you do have any questions about these theories of observational learning, then please reach out and let me know. Now, I just have one more video lecture for you. In that one, I'll be going over some of the mass media effects that research and observational learning has discovered. So I'd encourage you to check out that video lecture too when you get a chance. It's gonna do it for this one though. So I hope you guys have a great day and I'll catch you next time. Take care.